Welcome to another lecture by Medical Medics, Learning Made Easy. Anatomy Chapter 5, The Respiratory System. In this lecture, we will talk about the functions and anatomy of the respiratory system. We will discuss the upper and lower tracts, alveoli and gas exchange, mechanics of breathing, regulation of breathing, clinical relevance, so some respiratory disorders, some diagnostic tools, and end with a summary. Now let's start with the functions of the respiratory system. Function number one, it facilitates gas exchange, which means oxygen is coming in and carbon dioxide is going out. Furthermore, it regulates blood pH through carbon dioxide levels. It enables vocalization via the larynx. It provides olfactory sensation. It protects the body by filtering, warming, and humidifying air. Now let's delve into the anatomy of the respiratory system. It is divided into the upper and lower respiratory tracts. So the upper respiratory tract covers the nose, the nasal cavity, sinuses, the pharynx, and the larynx, while the lower respiratory tract covers the trachea, the bronchi, bronchioles, and the lungs, and the dia diaphragm and the intercostal muscles assist in breathing. Now you can see these different structures illustrated here. We have the larynx, we have the trachea, so the air tube, we have two lungs, we have the diaphragm, muscle here, we have uh, bronchioles and the nasal cavity here. So air travels in, travels down our trachea, and then goes either to our left or right lung through structures called bronchi. And then they travel further down into smaller and smaller structures called bronchioles, eventually arriving at the alveoli where the gas exchange is happening. Now let's delve deeper into the upper respiratory tract. So we have the nose and the nasal cavity. Its function is to filter warm and humidify air. And it contains olfactory receptors. Further in we have the pharynx or the throat. So this is the passageway for both air and for food. Now it is further divided into the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. And you can see them here, illustrated here, and further down here. Then we have the larynx, also known as the voice box. This is where vocal cords are housed. Furthermore, we have the epiglottis here, which prevents food from entering the airways. So the epiglottis is a structure that will move down to close uh, the airway when you are swallowing. So when you're eating something, you do not want to have the risk of that food getting into your uh, trachea, to your airways. So the epiglottis closes this structure and instead the food goes down your esophagus, down to your stomach. And vice versa. So when you're breathing in, the epiglottis is not, has not been uh, put to close this path. Now let's look at the lower respiratory tract. So here we have the trachea or the windpipe. As you can see here, this structure. It is supported by C-shaped cartilage rings. As it goes down, the trachea divides into the left and right bronchi, so here and here. Furthermore, the bronchi and bronchioles, so the bronchi branches into smaller bronchioles. It is similar to having a big artery, let's say, that then divides into arterioles and further down to capillaries. So similarly here we have the bronchi, 
branching into smaller bronchioles. Now, the bronchi and the bronchioles are lined with cilia to trap and move debris. The lower respiratory tract, aside from the trachea, the bronchi and bronchioles, also includes the lungs. This is where we have alveoli, where gas and or gas exchange occurs. Now, the right lung has three lobes. The left lung has two lobes. Now, let's talk about alveoli and gas exchange. So, alveoli are tiny air sacs surrounded by capillaries. What happens is that oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses out. So, look at this illustration here. We have the capillaries, right, where our red blood cells are flowing through. And then we have the alveolar sac here. And as you can see, they are surrounded by the capillaries. So what is supposed to be happening? Well, we have, hopefully, um, deoxygenated blood that is passing through here. If you remember from our cardiovascular introduction anatomy lesson, we had blood returning through our vena cavas back to the right atrium. That deoxygenated blood then traveled to the right ventricle and then through the pulmonary artery into your lungs. Now, when it's traveled into your lungs, we are now essentially here. So that deoxygenated blood is passing nearby these alve uh, alveoli. And what happens is that this deoxygenated blood containing carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli. And as we're breathing, air is coming in and oxygen is then diffused into the blood and becomes oxygenated. Now we have another important structure, which is surfactant. It prevents the alveolar collapse from collapsing. So here you can see an illustration of surfactant layer. Now gas exchange occurs due to the partial pressure gradient of gases. Now let's talk about the mechanisms of breathing. So we have inhalation or inspiration. This is when the diaphragm contracts and flattens. External intercostal muscles elevate the ribs. Thoracic cavity volume then increases and pressure decreases. So if you look at this first illustration here, you see that the uh, diaphragm, right? The diaphragm flattens out. And as it flattens out, by contracting, the volume of this thoracic cavity will then increase, right? This big structure, the diaphragm, uh, contracts, flattens, so you will have more space. And so what will happen to the total pressure when you have more space presenting? Well, pressure will go down. And the elevation of your ribs occurs through the external intercostal muscles. So these spaces between the ribs are called intercostal spaces. So we have the first intercostal, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. Now these are lined with muscles. Now what about expiration or exhalation? What happens here is that the diaphragm then relaxes, seen here, and returns to this initial shape. What will then happen to the total volume? Well, it will, um, the uh, volume will decrease, so the, in the uh, pressure would, would uh, increase. Now let's talk about the regulation of breathing. So this is controlled by the respiratory center in the brainstem, in the medulla and the pons.
we have chemoreceptors that detect CO2, O2, so oxygen and pH levels in our blood. If we detect high CO2 levels, this will stimulate increased breathing rate and depth. Now, let's talk about some respiratory disorders. So we have asthma, inflammation and narrowing of our airways. We have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, like chronic bronchitis or emphysema. We have pneumonia, so an infection causing inflammation of the alveoli. We can have lung cancer, uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the lungs. We can have a pulmonary embolism where a blood clot in our, from our circulation could end up in the lung blocking a pulmonary artery. Another thing, just to give a bit more of a clinical picture, remember we just talked about the alveoli, right? So we mentioned this alveol alveolar sac surrounded by capillaries and blood flow and where gas exchange is supposed to occur. Now imagine there is a inflammation, right, of the alveoli. What will happen during inflammation? Well, fluid will build up and prolonged can even cause damage and scarring and the destruction of this sac. So imagine you have a reduced uh, function of your alveoli. Will the gas exchange continue? No. So what could happen over time? Imagine you have continuous fluid buildup in many of these alveolar sacs. What kind of clinical presentation could be presented? Now we call these, for example, pneumonia. And when we auscultate the patient using our stethoscope, we even pick up on crackles and noises. There is a fluid buildup. Now let's talk about some common diagnostic tools. We have the pulmonary function tests. These assess for lung capacity and airflow. We have chest x-rays and CT scans where we visualize lung structure and pathology. We can do pulse oximetry where we measure oxygen saturation in the blood. Arterial blood gases where we analyze gas exchange efficiency. So for example, some patients will breathe into a spirometer, checking for their capacity, how well their lungs are functioning. If we have a patient with pneumonia or something, we can do a chest x-ray to see if there are signs of buildup of fluid. Or if we find scarring or fibrosis, fibrosis, or if we suspect lung cancer, etc. So we want to visualize the lungs. Again, we want to measure the oxygen saturation in blood. We put a pulse oximetry on their often finger, and you can measure. And further, if we want to know if the gas exchange is efficient, we do arterial blood gases. So in summary then, the respiratory system enables oxygen intake and carbon dioxide elimination. The respiratory system is divided into the upper and lower tracts, each with specific roles. Gas exchange occurs in alveoli via diffusion. Breathing mechanics involve coordinated muscle activity and pressure changes. Understanding respiratory disorders and diagnostics is indeed crucial in clinical practice. And that's the end of chapter 5. Continue now to chapter 6.